recently has been appointed professor at the University of Kampen, and he will talk about the Dutch view. So if you want to come, sure. okay, and Well, thank you for this opportunity to reflect with you on the issue of this conference, Brexit, borders, and belonging. Of course, when it comes to the theme of this conference, uh, <coughs> we should be aware that this is not the only conference that addresses this issue. Just before I came to uh, the UK, I saw that the next conference of the International Reform Theological Institute uh, will have its upcoming conference in July 2019 on the very same issue. And the title of that uh, conference at the Amsterdam Free University is The Calling of the Church in Times of Polarization. Now, that particular theme of the International Reformed Institute may point in a slightly different direction, but I guess it's, it's very similar. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about exclusion, inclusion, identity, our hope to overcome othering. It is about being caught between the powers of Pentecost and the powers of polarization, I submit. Now, I've been requested to offer some ecumenical perspectives, and as Eleonora explained, I'm, I will do so uh, specifically for my work with the Netherlands Mission Council and its related uh, networks. Uh, I also do so as a theologian, or more specifically, a mission theologian. Um, and I will try to, to link uh, CWM conference, the, the, the theme of the CWM conference, to the missionary calling of the church in the midst of Brexit, borders and belonging, or rather in the midst of polarization, populism and exclusion. For me, the basic issues are what is our calling and what is our role from a specifically missional perspective. Now, let me start by providing you some information about my personal bias, or if you will, my biography that may help to, to understand where I'm coming from. And then I'll make a few remarks on the social and ecclesial context in the Netherlands followed by some ecumenical perspectives. My personal bias, first of all. Uh, Gray Smith, uh, in his paper on the revenge of the racists, refers to the correlation of internationalism and voting to remain. And he, re he refers specifically to evangelicals in the UK who have an internationalist attitude. <coughs> I suspect that this correlation is not only the case in the UK, uh, but elsewhere just as much. And I personally may be an example of that. I was brought up in a very mission-minded evangelical church. And from the time I was a teenager, I've listened to countless sermons by people uh, from other nationalities, both from Western countries and from Africa and particularly Asia. Now this background, um, in an evangelical church has also determined my theological journey, practically in the sense that it seemed logical to pursue uh, theological studies abroad. First, I lived in Switzerland for two years, later for two years in the USA, and after concluding my theological studies at the Free University of uh, Amsterdam and Utrecht University, my church, the Netherlands Reformed Church back then, sent me to Indonesia as a missionary co-worker. Theologically, those eight years abroad and working with many ecumenical partners shaped the way I look at the calling of the church. To me, doing theology cannot be limited to the reformed theological or confessional family or to Dutch theology as such. That the other equally contributes, as is often stated in migration discourse, applies to theology as well. Internationalism, in a sense, is nothing but a self-evident precondition in ecumenical relations. 
So maybe it won't come as a surprise to you that I was quite shocked to hear about the result of the Brexit referendum. Voting Remain, in my humble opinion, would have been the right thing to do, which only shows my bias and probable insensitivity to the voice of populism and issues which are raised by its leaders. I'm quite sure, dear friends, that I'm guilty as hell for not having listened sufficiently to the voices of those who are not happy with migration, open borders, and increasing European integration, or those who fear the free movement of people results in massive social change in our cities. I may therefore have been complicit in providing fertile space for the growth of populist sentiments, and that bothers me. I wrestle with that. Secondly, when it comes to personal bias, I should mention that internationalism has seriously impacted my family as well. My daughter, influenced by many discussions at our dinner table, decided to become a teacher in a multicultural primary school in a multi-ethnic neighborhood in Utrecht. None of her pupils was born in the Netherlands. My son, particularly due to the years in Indonesia, became very much interested in intercultural psychology and he decided to develop, his, to develop his international perspective by moving to the UK. For the past eight years, he has studied and worked at LSE's Institute for Social, Social Sciences. At one point, he started dating a lovely and very talented woman from Chile and considered moving to Chile in Latin America. And that made me realize there are limits to my internationalism. <laughs> Imagining a son living in Chile was quite hard for me, simply too far away from my taste. Two years ago, almost to my relief, I admit, he married a Dutch girl, a film producer who lived in Switzerland, the US, and the UK for the past 10 years. I'm telling you this because my son and his wife continue, continuously tell me they are getting very annoyed with the ongoing Brexit discussions in the UK, particularly with its references of exclusion, sentiments around restricting free movement and increased levels of othering and they've recently decided to move back to the Netherlands sometime next year. They increasingly feel the burden of imposed borders and don't feel anymore that they belong where they are now. I hasten to say that my son and his wife will soon discover that the Netherlands is no different because we have exactly the same discussions as you have in the UK. Now let me elaborate a bit on specifics of the Dutch context before I offer some perspectives <coughs> on challenges in our calling to live as disciples of Christ in the midst of the European debate. About the Dutch context. Karin van der Broeke, the former chairperson of the Protestant Church in the Netherlands and member of WCC's Central Committee, recently wrote about unity after Brexit. And she pointed at the aspiration of the ecumenical movement to achieve unity. Of course, that regards unity in church and mission. But with regards to the European project, she states that the dream of European unity is broken. Support for the European project was clear in the Carta Ecumenica of 2001. But now she said it is adamant to shape solidarity in a post-Brexit context. She was writing about this in a context of Dutch Euroscepticism, some Dutch political parties thriving on populist sentiments in our society have a tendency to glorify the European Judeo-Christian heritage, but are at the same time miles removed from what the chair of our church meant by solidarity. The former chair of the European Council, the Belgian Herman van Rompuy, I'm not quite sure how you say that in English. Herman van Rompuy? <laughs> say it in Dutch. Say it in Dutch, okay. He contends that Europe is both an adventure and an ideal. 
he said that very reasonably in his published anti-memoirs on page 49 through 54. An adventure, he says, because it was a bold step, especially from leaders in Germany and France to shape a union that intended to stimulate economic cooperation in order to prevent future wars. It was a bold step that meant, quoting Van Rompuy in his acceptance speech for the Nobel, Nobel Peace Prize for the European Union in 2012, to break with the endless cycle of violence, to put an end to eternal revenge and to convince citizens that we can build a better future together. It was an ideal, he said, because the EU has only existed for some 60 years, whereas Britain and France are centuries old. Europe is a project, an ideal, and its identity has yet to get shape. Again, quoting Van Rompuy, identity is a normal human need. Everybody wants to belong. We offer what is close to us, family, village, our region, and language, our country. But the EU is not a country. Yet, he states, European politics is domestic politics. It is both place and space. Place, for him, is providing protection, home stability, and space <coughs> is about providing opportunities. And he recognizes that the current crisis, including Brexit, has to do with over-accentuating space at the cost of place. Mm. Europe is not regarded as our home, but as a threat to local identity. And a new balance has to be struck, he contends. In that sense, it would be a mistake, in my opinion, to regard Geert Wilders, I guess you know him as well, well-known leader of Dutch Populist Party, as a mere yet dangerous clown. He addresses fundamental issues with regards to space and place. And I have to admit that some in our church, in our Protestant church, recognize this and critique the way our leadership, the synod leadership, naively embraces European ideals while neglecting justified sentiments around a perceived erosion or lack of place. And to, and to be clear on this, I feel quite strongly about Wilders. Um, in my opinion, what he does and says is highly destructive and divisive. But he is not 100% wrong. And that's exactly why, in my opinion, he's, what he says is so dangerous. And we should pick up, we should have the flexibility to address some of the issues uh, he is discussing. I'm coming now to some ecumenical perspectives on Brexit. In November 2017, a conference was held at Tilburg University in the south of our country, and its theme was no doubt inspired by discussions on Brexit. For the title read as follows, The Brexit of Monk Willy Broad. You may recall uh, this English missionary who left the relative comfort of his monastery in Yorkshire and became the apostle of the Frisians in my country. He became a church planter, a pioneer, and established a church planter school in Utrecht, the so-called Salvator College for missionaries who had to be trained for the ministry. We may wonder why, around the year 690, Willie Broad decided to exit England. <laughs> Was his Brexit caused by the restrictions of monastic life, or possible unease with the comfort of living in the confines of a Christian institution, place? Or was it his desire to find space on the European continent? I'm not sure historical documents can help us to determine how Willie Broad felt about these issues. But somehow, and surely, Willie Broad's Brexit was related to a calling. It was an assignment to mission. Now, I readily admit that the title of this Tilburg conference and speaking of Willebrod's Brexit is somewhat artificial, to say the least, even cynical, perhaps. Yet, 
it focuses our attention to a core issue, namely that voting to leave or remain in Christian perspective cannot be seen apart from a calling to cross boundaries and borders and to journey together as people from all nations. The theme Brexit, borders and belonging should therefore, in my view, be addressed from the perspective of the calling of the church to be pilgrims together. That does not exclude the secular or religiously different other. As in our society, we travel with all people who want to contribute to the common good. We all exit. We are all called to leave our comfortable place and to enter new space by crossing borders of ethnicity, nationality, social security, and social class. It therefore greatly bothers me that, according to Gray Smith, a majority of frequent churchgoers voted leave, apparently for nativistic reasons, possibly bordering on xenophobia. Why is it that evangelicals do better? I'm not sure. Is it because of their internationalism? which they might have in their DNA, as Smith suggests? Are they less conservative than the average mainland Anglican? If this is all true, how about the evangelicals in the USA who support Trump? Uh, it baffles me. I don't know the answer, but it raises issues that need to be addressed. Are evangelicals more prone to obey the scripture commandment to love our neighbor are they more obedient to that, the mainline Protestants? Is there a stronger ethical appeal in ev evangelical preaching? Does it have to do with an urgent evangelical sense of cross-cultural mission and to shape Christian communities that demonstrate good news that God wants to include people in his fellowship and grace? Coming back to Geert Wilders and Euroscepticism. One of our national newspapers reported in, in December 2016 that Europe divides the Dutch Protestants. René de Reuver, our General Secretary, opts for unity in Europe as something that is very much in line with gospel values. He says it stands for democratic values. It stands for human dignity and for upholding human rights. That is utterly naive, others say. It overlooks the, neg overlooks the negative impact of European policies on free movement of people, they say, thereby allowing many Muslim immigrants to find space and place on the continent. It overlooks, they say, the voice of many people who are angry and who experience unease with <coughs> social change. And it results in alienation from the church distrust of politician and public institutions. The church, these critics, also within the Protestant church, state that we should not always make a plea for cohesion. They say it should, the church should resist what is in contradiction with its confession, not what contradicts cohesion. In other words, sometimes there needs to be distance and critique of political ideas, they say. The church, they say, should hear the voice of those who are concerned and honestly address negative effects of migration and free movement. But it refuses to do so, they say, and the church in effect smothers the debate with references to love your neighbor. And that's it. Now, reflecting on this, on the different voices in my church in the Netherlands, what future do we envision in the midst of imminent Brexit, restoring borders and threatened belonging? The Conference of European Churches, in its open letter of June 2016, as you may remember, referred explicitly to the Carta Ecumenica, in which it strongly supported the European project and specifically pointed to common values in our European societies. In its open letter, it urges us to return to the fundamental issues 
of common values as Europeans seem to have lost sight of these. Mistrust, the open letter states, has replaced the call to shape and express unity according to shaped values. <coughs> and it points specifically to what was reached through the European project, life and prosperity in peace that flourished in war during Europe, a vision that came up in the midst of post-war upheaval and chaos, in the midst of food shortages, countless displaced people and lack of housing. The 1950 declaration called for remembering and demonstrating the Christian value of forgiveness and reconciliation. The European Union, Keck states, demonstrates that it is a community that pursues human dignity, peace, abides by the rule of law, upholds solidarity and sustainability. And in its recommendation, therefore, Keck calls for stepping up efforts to make Christian virtues more visible. Now, that certainly is not the whole gospel, not our mission in the ultimate sense, but certainly it is part of our mission in the public domain. In conclusion, I submit that our discussion is not all about the three Bs, Brexit, borders, and belonging. Neither is it all about the four Ps, which were submitted by the Bishop of Uppsala, Antje Jacqueline, She's, she suggested for peace, namely polarization, populism, protectionism, and post-truth. Although I very much agree with these four Ps, I feel it's too much about uh, an analysis of the context as such. But maybe we need more. I would suggest, following her example, some extra Ps. Three Ps again, that underscore our faith and missionary calling, namely the power of Pentecost, presence, pilgrimage, and prosperity for all. Just a few scant remarks, very briefly. The power of Pentecost is what we believe in with all our hearts. It directs our ministry. It breaks through all possible borders, and it unites people from all nations in a mess messianic journey that demonstrates new life in Christ and power of the spirit that covers the earth. It's a vision, it's a promise that draws us to its fulfillment. That's our faith, the first P. And then the last three Ps. The mission can be summarized in those three Ps. Presence in society, which implies continued witness, being prophets, living in solidarity with people around us, presence. And the second one, pilgrimage. Pilgrimage that is grounded in discipleship, in doing justice, reconciliation, and living in mutual forgiveness. And prosperity, the last P, prosperity for all in the sense of our willingness to share both our place and space with others. How can all of us flourish? How can, we just, how can we justly distribute resources, welfare, etc.? The mission, I grant you, is daunting enough. <coughs> but nobody said being a disciple will be easy. Thank you. Thank you. And we quickly move over to Mario Fischer, who is the General Secretary of the